What about Christians who boast that Christianity uh, gave rise to modern science? As opposed to any ancient philosophers really establishing any kind of standards. Was it Christianity that brought us into the modern age of science or established certain principles that we use today? Or is there another story? Yeah, exactly. No. Um, only in the like, causal coincidence that, that science was recovered under a Christian regime. But it wasn't Christianity that caused it, right? It was that, in fact, the scientists who wanted this recovery of this idea and this tradition had to repaganize Christianity, basically recapture those pagan values and put them back into Christianity. Wait, 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 uh, so, okay, so, so Christians and the Christian regime didn't have an actual deity leading them in this, and they weren't getting this from the Bible. <laughs> no, of course. Well, yeah, there's no science in the Bible, right? You don't see defense of curiosity in the Bible. You don't see defense of empiricism or scientific methods in the Bible. You don't see any mention of progress in knowledge uh, and improvement of society in terms of or learning things and structuring things differently. Like, all of those values are not in the Bible. And they're not in Christian theology either. And the, the Christian theology that was created in the Middle Ages was very hostile to these things. Um, and I show this in my book, The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire. I have a whole chapter in uh, The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire that covers this um, concept that shows that the first three centuries, Christians were very hostile to these ideas. And even in the Middle Ages, sco other scholars have shown that they kept sort of this hostility or indifference to these values. And it was only by restoring these values uh, that science was able to, to launch again. So the fact that it was relaunched under a Christendom is just a coincidence of history again. Uh, but it was still the pagan ideals that had to come in. And there isn't really anything else Christianity contributed. And when you read uh, these uh, Christian apologists who try to argue that Christianity was responsible, they have all these ideas that are all contradicted by the evidence of ancient science. And this is why studying ancient science is so important for really getting our history and, uh, correct, basically. Both the history of Christianity and the history of science itself. History of human knowledge, history of human civilization. Because when you actually go and look at the actual evidence of antiquity, it does not match what the Christians are claiming. And so they, they, they have this idea that Christianity introduced all these new ideas that, in fact, were already going ideas in the ancient world. And, um, and so there, there really isn't any model for saying that Christianity is responsible for modern science. It really feels like that um, when you go to church and you listen to kind of the same one of three to five messages every Sunday, all year long. It, it really sounds like there's just no progress there. It's, it's either the Jesus answer, or get baptized, or give money, and then some modification of the three. Um, so that's what it feels like, having been a Christian for 20 years myself, mm -hmm. um, that that's the only thing that's really promoted in the culture of Christianity. Yeah, let me give you an example. Like Even if you find exceptions, that the fact that there's such rare exceptions proves the proves the rule, right? So uh, I looked like in the Middle Ages for uh, examples of Christians attempting to educate the public in scientific principles, and I only found one, which was that in 900 something A.D. There's this uh, a Christian preacher, Rabanus Maris, who actually gives this homily, this this sermon, where he's really annoyed by uh, by the the common people. Um, what would happen when there's a lunar eclipse? The common people would bang pots and blow horns and stuff in the middle of the night to try and scare away the dragon eating the moon or whatever. Uh, and, um, or or the, just dispel the witch's spells or whatever it was. There was some sort of superstition. And he got really annoyed by this because it woke him up and it bugged the hell out of him. So he gives this whole sermon on, like, look, people, it's just the shadow of the earth across the moon, right? So he's, like, trying to educate his congregation on, on basic lunar science. And we have examples of this in the pagan world too, where, where pagans tried to educate the masses. We have a famous example where a, a supposedly a battle was won where a, one of the generals explained to his troops that it's not dragons eating the moon. It's, it's anyway, so <laughs> it's a kind of a similar story. But, uh, but he doesn't, in that sermon, he just basically berates them for not knowing the truth. It's no, it's just the shadow of the moon or shadow of the earth on the moon. He doesn't like inculcate like, and isn't it amazing that we could figure that out? You know, this is why curiosity is really important. This is why, you know, taking evidence as your authority rather than me. Like you can go prove this yourself. You don't have to take me as an authority. Uh, we can make progress in knowledge. Think of what else we could learn if we applied the same method. None of that is in a sermon, right? Yeah. It's all just, no, we just know this. Just shut up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, <laughs> so even that example like shows like like they just, they're still dropping the ball. Like they, they're just using, you know, basically cannibalized, recycled science from the ancient world without even comprehending what was necessary to even achieve that knowledge and advance beyond it. Okay, but yeah, but they're established and they believe God established them and uh, their culture. And when they die, they're going to heaven. Is there really, Richard, is there really a need for scientific progress when you have the promise 
of eternity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if it was a true promise, maybe you wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> this is one thing that people often forget, uh, get wrong about the the Jesus of the Gospels, right? Like his extremely harsh, like radical pacifism. Like, no, don't don't fight back. Like, if someone steals stuff, like give them more stuff. Let them steal stuff. If they take you to court, give them everything. If they enslave you, let them enslave you. If they force you to walk a mile, do it. Do more. Like, do, never resist anything. And you think like that's super. Like, let them take everything. Let them abuse you. Let them kill you. It doesn't matter. Like, don't even fight back. You know, like, that's crazy. But it's not crazy if you think that you're going to go to heaven for eternity, right? So it's like, no, it's going to be over. Just lickety split. Like, you know, you'll be able to, like, 10, 20 years you have to deal with this, and then it's eternity and bliss, right? So you can endure, like, people abusing you for 10 to 20 years. It's not a big deal, given the reward you're going to get. So it, in that framework, of course, it makes sense to be a radical pacifist, radical non-resistor. Um, or, yeah, so... Uh, so the, the whole like sort of bizarre behavior that Jesus is recommending makes sense in that context, that apocalyptic context. Um, but it doesn't make sense because it isn't true, right? Like that this is, that's not it. Like this is it. This life is all you've got basically. And that's something that science, you know, has supported, in, you know, what we found in terms of like, well, what, what does death mean for the human um, and psychology and all of this stuff? Like the, the, the idea of an eternal life is not supported by what we found scientifically. It could have, like, it's theoretically possible that if a god built the world a certain way, that it would be possible to scientifically prove everything he's saying is true about immortality and all of this stuff. But that's not what we found, right? We found that no, it's just a superstition. It has no support in science, and even the science we have is contradicting it. So um, when you realize that, then you realize that no, you can't rely on that promise. That all we've got is each other. Like, the only way you're going to make the only heaven and hell there are is what we make here. And that means we better figure out the best ways to fix the world, like to make progress in terms of, you know, uh, human welfare and all of these things. And that's where you need technology. That's where you need scientific knowledge. And that's where science underlies all of this stuff. Science is the only path towards salvation. And it's not a perfect salvation. It's not going to be uh, eternal bliss. It's just, it's all we've got, right? Like it's, it's, you know, it has its limitations and it has its problems. You have to keep monitoring but it is the best thing that is actually existent, that actually actually improves human lives. And you think in terms of how we've extended human lifespan, uh, how we've uh, greatly reduced maternal mortality rates. Like, if you look at all of the things that we've done in terms of food distribution, uh, oh, clean water, people take that so for granted. Yeah. Um, that water used to be highly a major source of, of killing large numbers of people, like having spoiled water systems. We have, you can just walk almost anywhere in the uh, United States and find a tap out of which comes clean, reliably clean water. I mean, that that's like mind boggling from the perspective of antiquity, but that's what we've achieved through science and technology. And, and that's just one example of countless others. So yeah, we, we definitely need science. Science is, uh, science is our savior uh, in terms of what we can actually accomplish in terms of making the world closer to a heaven and further from a hell. And it's a savior that we've created. Yeah, we had to make it ourselves, right? We didn't learn yeah. it from the Bible. God didn't reveal it to us. We had to figure it out ourselves, uh, which I think is actually a pretty good argument against the existence of God. Because I think I think if there was a God, he would have he would have realized we needed this tech and given it to us early. Yeah. So if science is so great and it has such a positive impact, why are there cultures such as what may be found in religion that heavily resist it or devalue it? Yeah, to a large extent, it's because they don't realize how much they depend on science. And it's this example of like the people just take for granted the, free, the clean water that comes out of the tap, right? There's, there's, they don't realize how much their lives depend on this. Uh, and if you look at anti-vaxxer movement, for example, they have no comprehension of the fact that they'd probably be dead now if it was not for vaccines, right? Like there would be, we could probably, I think we could probably count about half the people they know who are their friends, family, and so forth that would not exist, they'd be dead but for vaccines. Uh, and so they, they don't realize that. And so all they see is like this sort of crazy conspiracy theory that they're looking at in the real world uh, that, that, that's really pressing on them. And so they cr construct this idea of what they think is correct and the best path without stepping back and looking at the big picture and realizing what the facts are. And, and that's true for religions. That's true for any kind of woo, any kind of pseudoscience and so on. Um, it's, it's just focusing on a few things that, that draw you and not paying attention to the big picture. And, and that's, I mean, I think that's the main thing that's hardest to get people past. If someone were to stack in one hand, uh, maybe some things that have saved them in science, you know, like clean water, vaccinations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the other hand, the 
superstitious savior in which they believe, um, which hand would start getting weighed down more, faster? <laughs> in terms of demonstrated outcomes? Yes. <laughs> Obviously, the science hand would be the heaviest of them all. But, but uh, Richard, so many people have experiences. <laughs> And so many people say, if it wasn't for Jesus, or if it wasn't for God, or if it wasn't for Allah, right. you know, and they will tell you, and they stake their life on it, they stake yeah. their reputation on it, they're passionate, they're enthusiastic, you know, they live half their lives mm -hmm. telling this to others. This, yeah. yeah, so are you telling me that if somebody yeah. just reflected for five minutes, they would say, well, all science. Wow. No, they, they, would, they were not reflecting five minutes, because what you're talking about, like the whole, like, all these lucky things that happened to me must come from God. Right, to understand why that's not logical requires really understanding statistics and probability theory, right? And that's not easy, right? You can't just do that in five minutes. If you haven't learned that stuff, it's gonna take longer than five minutes for you to learn it. But it's another example of looking at the big picture, understanding, like, if you look at in terms of just probability, obviously if there's no God, lucky chances and good luck things are gonna happen to you anyway, right? But it's hard to get to the point of realizing that, yeah, and when you're looking at there's six billion people on the planet, that means uh, if, if you say some lucky thing happens to you and it's a billion to one odds against, well, actually, it's happening to six people because, <laughs> right, six billion people. So uh, these sort of incredible good luck events are definitely going to happen just on sheer chance alone. But to get to the point where you understand that and realize, oh, okay, so then I need to be able to distinguish what is just lucky outcome and what is something that actually is uh, a supernaturally caused thing. And then, of course, that's even after you've eliminated the stuff that's not actually a lucky outcome, but it's actually science. So someone will say, like, God cured my cancer. And well, actually, you had a whole bunch of medical treatment. <laughs> right? Like, science <laughs> cured your cancer. It wasn't God. Um, but even if you eliminate that, like, people realize, like, no, actually, science is doing what you're talking about. Uh, you still have these chance coincidences. You have to sort of, how do you tell the difference between just being lucky and God doing something for you? And, and, and if you don't sit back and reflect and think, oh, actually, I don't know how to tell the difference between those two things. Um, then you can't make that argument, right? And so, but that's, that's again of stepping back and looking at the big picture, which most people don't do. So if we just step back and we really looked at what science has given us, which essentially is what our mothers and fathers have given us mm -hmm. um, throughout the century, throughout the millennia, yeah. what we've given ourselves, we will arrive at the point, if we had enough understanding that yeah. We have saved ourselves up to this point. It is us that has yeah. given us this quality of life. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, it hasn't come from anywhere else. And of course, we have also given ourselves all the problems we're dealing with as well. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's why you have to keep moving forward, keep making progress. How do you build? A reliable worldview from scratch. How do we know our particular pieces of these worldviews are correct and not someone else's? Live that self-examined life. For those who think beyond boundaries, where is your pride? What's up everybody, Aurela Vinu here with Fully Deconverted and I want to say a huge thanks to all our donors that made the Carrier Series possible. Donors like Steve Watson, Dan Honchel, Terrell Wolbert, Reality Revolution, Scott Michael Burdage, Sam Stetson, Dino Rosati, and Mitzi Cordell. <laughs> as well as other persons like Nathan Dickey, Kristen Hood, and Peter Smayfield. Those were our executive producers and producers. Again, without you, wouldn't have been possible. Thank you.